as the Christ candle comes in, I'd invite you to sing with the choir. We are so glad that you are here. Our mission at WHPC is to invite people into God's larger story as we follow Christ together. We want to welcome you if you are worshiping with us virtually, either this morning on Sunday or some other time throughout the week. We have a lot planned for today to bless our children as they continue to go on with their school year. But most of all, we are gathered here before an audience of one. Will you stand and let us call ourselves to worship? We are all welcome here. We who are no longer strangers and aliens. We who are citizens with the saints. We who are members of the household of God. We are all welcome here. Whatever our worldly status might be, wherever our earthly citizenship lies, whoever makes up our primary household, we are all welcome here. We are all loved here. We gather to welcome and love each other. Following the example of Jesus Christ, the one we gather to worship.
Waymaker, miracle worker, light in the darkness, and redeemer. That's who we're here to worship this day. And it begins by each of us arriving in this place, sure of who we are, and sure of our need for God's forgiveness and mercy. So will you join me now in our prayer of confession? Let us pray. God, we so easily divide, vilify, and neglect others. We are quick to anger and take offense, slow to forgive and to understand. Forgive us. Help us by the power of your spirit to overcome our differences, to see through the eyes of another, to reach out with compassion instead of judgment. May our thoughts and actions express the generosity of your love and grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, there's only one who would be in a position to condemn us, and that one is our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us, who rose for us, who reigns in power for us, and who prays for us. Each of us here today are a new creation. The past is finished and gone, and each of us get a second chance. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are a forgiven people. And let all God's people say, amen.
All are welcome in this place, and that hospitality doesn't just come out of the goodness of our hearts. It comes from the hospitality of our God in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that brings peace, peace that fills this place and peace enough to share. So let us share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And now safely, let's share that with one another. I do want to welcome you all here on this amazing Sunday, and especially if you are a guest, we welcome you. And if it's your first time, I want to invite you to meet me out in the narthex. I'd like to meet you face to face. My name is Emily Wright. I'm the pastor here. And we also have a first time visitor gift for you. This is the beginning of a lot of new things that are going on this very week. This Wednesday, our youth ministry, 6th through 12th grade, is kicking off with Color Wars. You can find out all about that online or ask any of our student ministry staff that are here. This is going to be a fun event, outreach event for you to be able to invite friends. Right before Color Wars, our Youth Bells begins at 545 right in this space. And then a week from today, our Youth Choir. This is going to be a great opportunity for you, your kids to be learning scripture, learning the, the classics of the faith in song, and I want to encourage you to consider committing that this semester. Then we have our final welcome all gathering next Sunday at the 945 hour. I don't know if you've heard about it, but you kind of have missed out if you haven't. Stacy's been teaching right in here during that hour, and then we finish and have breakfast under the tent. So I want you to come next week and check that out. We are looking for ways and trying to provide ways for all of us to get reconnected back into life, even in the midst of an ongoing pandemic, we are not going to stop doing ministry and life together. And so we are going to have some new connect groups. They will start up on September 12th. You can go ahead and register. There's going to be groups that meet here on Sunday mornings. There's going to be groups that meet virtually during the week. There's going to be lots of options. So go online and check out this opportunity to be able to deepen your understanding of what community is, but also connecting with new folks around here. We begin today, one of my favorite seasons of the year, which is officer nominating season. And the reason it's my favorite is because the Presbyterian Church is organized so that it is not supposed to be just the people that are paid that do the ministry. But it's supposed to be all of us having our own ministry, and some are set apart to do a specific ministry of caring. And those are deacons. And I want you to hear from some of our deacons about what it has meant to them to be a deacon at this church. What being a deacon has meant for me is having an opportunity to come alongside those in our community of faith who are having a difficult time and providing prayer and providing service and just being there for them as a sounding board when these difficult times arise. I have gotten to see God's work in our community of faith and how he's provided hope and provision for those that are struggling. This has been a great experience for me. It's helped me, it's deepened my faith, it's helped me to focus on how can I help other people, thinking not just so me, about me, but what can I do to, to be of service? It's been a great experience for me because uh, while I've known a lot about how the church operated, I really, being a deacon has put the sort of the flesh and blood into 
the body of Christ here at the church. It's really deepened my faith in that it has made me much more aware of us as a body and not just an institution. Being a deacon has deepened my faith in the power of prayer and the belief that God truly is walking with each of us. Delivering a, a package or a, a flowers or something to somebody who is homebound or sending a letter of condolence for losing a loved one or anything we can do to help people who are going through difficulties in their life. These characteristics come to mind that a deacon should have. Compassion and a willingness to help those in need. Ability to listen, to be reliable and caring, to have integrity and commitment to the faith in Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you, if you have been called to be a deacon, go ahead and jump for the call because you will be much more blessed than the people in our congregation that you are blessing. So if y'all go on our website today, the nomination forms are right there for you to consider who this kind of rings a bell with you for. And if you felt a stirring within yourself, I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider becoming an officer set apart for the ministry of caring in this church. As we prepare to hear God's word, will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we have come from so many places with so much going on in our world around us. And so we take this time to listen to you. I pray that the words that are read would be yours. The words that are preached would be yours. And the words that fall deeply within us would be yours. So much so that we could not leave here the same as we entered. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So in the movie X-Men... There is this character named Mystique here played by Jennifer Lawrence, and she is this mutant that has this superpower. You're going to get to see some of what she can do. She can change into any person that she wants to be. And there are many times in the course of these movies that you are tricked. Suddenly, you think it's one person, and then the scene changes, and you realize, oh, that wasn't that person. It actually was Mystique. This summer, we were introduced to another character who has a different set of identities, Luca. If you haven't seen this yet, I want to recommend it for all ages, I'm happy to say. Luca is a sea monster on the right, and he discovers one day, I'm not giving anything away, that when he comes out of the water, he becomes an ordinary boy, and Luca loves being an ordinary boy and getting to do things like ride a moped and bicycle and just play with two feet. Luca knows that if people were to find out on land that he was a monster, that they would soon turn and be afraid of him. And so the whole movie is this like suspense of making sure that his secret is kept hidden. So Mystique and Luca, they're, they're fictional characters, they're magical characters. They challenge the viewer, though, to consider what is someone's true identity? When you look at somebody, who are they really? Last week, we began this three-week sermon series called Welcome All. We started with Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, and we saw that a fundamental problem that this church was dealing with is that when they looked at each other, they actually all looked very different. They were different from different religious backgrounds. They had different economic backgrounds, and they are getting caught up in the things that divide them as opposed to the one thing that they do have in common, and that is that they are united in Christ. And time after time over the course of Jesus' ministry, we see that he is questioning this, this fact that we identify people so different. He constantly is calling to question, why are certain people, whether because of their nationality, whether because of their profession or their gender, their mental state or maybe a disability they have, why are they labeled? 
Why are they excluded? Why are they put into certain camps where they are not allowed? And this is the thing, as followers of Jesus, each of us are called to live our lives as Jesus did, and those are the people that Jesus sought out to be in relationship with. The ones that were excluded, the ones that were labeled, the ones that were on the margins, the cast off, the ones that when you approach, you might have to have an awkward conversation. To help us look deeper at how Jesus is encouraging all of us to welcome all, we are going to listen to a parable. And it's kind of almost like a mystique Luca Disney version in the first century. Our story today, it occurs two days before a Passover meal, and it's not just any Passover meal. It is the last Passover meal before Jesus dies. And Jesus is concerned about making sure that those disciples really get what it means that he's going to die and that he's going to rise again, and then one day he's going to come back. And so he tells them parable after parable, just trying to get their brains to figure out where he is headed. He makes sure to tell us that no one knows when he will return, not, not even himself, only God knows. And so don't spend any time trying to figure that out. Whenever I read these texts, these parables that are about what's to happen at the end, there's something within me, the Holy Spirit, I believe, that always is like, pay attention, pay attention, Emily, because when you think about at the end, what, what, what really matters? What really is going to matter about how we live our life? I don't want to miss us. I don't want us to miss this. I think Jesus told these parables specifically for that reason, so that we can be reminded when we get caught up in life, what really is most important. So here now, this familiar text from Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. And then the king will pull the sheep at his right hand and he will say, come, you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that you, we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to eat, something to drink. And when was it that we saw you a stranger, and welcomed you, or naked, and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison, and invited you? And then the king will answer, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are two things that surfaced for me this time from this text. First is that being a Christ follower means that we must live to meet the needs of those that have less. It it cannot be separated. And second, when we do that, when we meet the needs of those that have less, we're actually doing something for Jesus. When I identify as a Christian, it doesn't mean that it's just my faith or my religion. It means that I am following Christ. And to follow Christ, if we look at how Christ lived all throughout the Gospels, it means we are intentionally seeking to meet the needs of others. Meeting the needs of people that have less, it matters to Jesus. And so it should matter to me. For those of us that like checklists, anybody like checklists and boxes to, okay, this parable might be one of those things that you get tempted, you're like, okay, I'm going to list out, feed hungry, thirsty, 
visit people in prison. And, and then like once you get to the bottom, you're like, yes, I am a good Christian. I've been elevated to Jesus' pat on the back list. That's not what's happening here because it's a parable. And parables, Jesus does these, he tells the parables so that he can draw the listener in, draw the listener in so you feel like that the story that's being told you could place yourself in. So it can't be read literally. And so when we see Jesus say, sheep from the goats, did any of you think, am I a sheep or am I a goat? You did it. He did it. He drew you in to the story. So in the story, the sheep are the ones that are on the right hand. They're the ones that get the kingdom. They're the ones that Jesus calls blessed. And they are blessed. They are blessed because they met the needs of the least of these. I have struggled with that word, that phrasing, the least of these. It makes me feel like if there are least, then there are people that are better. It feels like a tier system, like the least are down here, and then all of us who don't have to worry about hunger, thirst, clothing, we must be more than I went back and looked at the use and the original use of this word, and and it actually doesn't mean to be something demoralizing or shaming. The word there means someone who has the least of certain things, certain means. How would it feel to be called a least? You must be a least. How demoralizing and shaming. There's this incredible book that I'm not going to, use the poem, I'm not going to read the poem up on a screen because I want you to all go buy it. It's called, My Name is Child of God, Not Those People. And it's a story by Julia Dinsmore. It's a first-person book of her life and poetry as a impoverished woman living in the continual cycle of poverty and the labels that she has been assigned by different people, and this is what she writes. She says, my name is not those people. I am a loving woman, a mother in pain, giving birth to the future where my babies have the same chance to thrive as anyone. My name is not inadequate. I did not make my husband leave us. He chose to and chooses not to pay child support. Truth is, though, there isn't a job base for all fathers to support their families. While society turns its head, my children pay the price. My name is not problem and case to be managed. I'm a capable human being and citizen, not just a client. The social service system can never replace the compassion and concern of loving grandparents, aunts, uncles, fathers, cousins, community, all the bonded people who need to be but are no longer present for me. My name is not lazy, dependent, welfare mother. If the unwaged work of parenting, homemaking, and community building were factored into the gross domestic product, my work would have untold value. And why is it that mothers whose husbands support them to stay home and raise children are glorified, and why don't they get called lazy or dependent? This is my favorite part. My name is not ignorant, dumb, or uneducated. I got my PhD from the University of Life. School of hard everything. I live with an income of $621 with $169 in food stamps for three kids. Rent is $585. That leaves $36 a month to live on. I am such a genius at surviving. I could balance the state budget in an hour. Never mind that there's a lack of living wage jobs. Never mind that it's impossible to be the sole emotional, social, spiritual, and economic support for a family. Never mind that parents are losing their children to gangs, drugs, stealing, prostitution, the poverty industry, social workers, kidnapping the streets, the predator. Forget about putting more money into our schools. Just build more prisons. My name is not lay down and die quietly. My love is powerful, and the urge to keep my children alive will never stop. All children need homes and people who love them. All children need safety and the chance to be the people they were born to be. The wind will stop before I allow my sons to become a statistic. 
before you give in to the urge to blame me, the blame that lets us go blind and unknowing into the isolation that disconnects your humanity from mine. Take another look. Don't go away, for I am not the problem but the solution, and my name is not those people. The word that's used here for least of these, it's not just those people. It's not just a category that we get to just shift people into. It's the, it's the people with the least. They're not identified as the least. It's the people with the least. These are the folks that have the least, as, least access. These are folks with the least control, with the least power, with the least voice. It really should be translated differently. Just as you did it to the person with the least access to have their needs met, you did it to me, Jesus said. We are not told anything. We are not told one single thing about the moral character of the hungry, the thirsty, the imprisoned, the naked, and the lonely. We are not told if they are Christian or Jewish or Muslim. We are not told what their gender is or their marital status. We are only told of a need that they have. And this is what connects us, is that all of us as humans have needs. And the difficulty of real life is that not everybody gets the same access. Not everybody gets to have the same opportunities to have those needs met. As followers of Christ, this is a charge to us. It is our responsibility to seek out to meet the needs of the least. Would I commit more time to serving others that look different than me, that are in different status than me, if I thought it was actually serving Jesus? Do y'all remember that phrase, WWJD, it was kind of a big deal 10, 15 years ago. Some people got tattoos of it. They all wore bracelets. It was this, there were notebooks. I mean, it was this craze, and it always bothered me. It, it bothered me for some reason. It was, what would Jesus do? It was a question that we were encouraged to ask before we made decisions or talked about something. And the ideology here is that we're supposed to act and speak like Jesus did. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not meaning to like cast shade on that whole movement. I think it did amazing work. But my concern with this is that it increases the risk of making me, making oneself the center of relationships. In our text, Jesus compares himself not to the person who is doing the feeding, not to the person who is doing the, the visiting in prison, not to the person who is caring for the sick. Oh, no, no, no. Jesus identifies with the one receiving it. Jesus in the story is the one to whom the least is needed. And this is so very important for us, friends. When was the last time that Emily fed a hungry person or welcomed a stranger or visited someone in prison that wasn't a friend, that wasn't a member of my congregation, that wasn't someone easier to meet the needs of. Who are the least right now around us? Who are the least around us? How can we feed, visit, and welcome them? All the things Jesus mentions, they are visible actions. Some of them are physical, which means it's our responsibility to make sure to, to feed those that are without food, to house those that are without housing, to visit those without people to visit. That is our responsibility. But then there's this emotional need. What would our daily lives look like? How would they be different if we were to see Christ in every person? Not consider ourselves Christ, but to see Christ in every person. This is stretching. This is going to be stretching to us. It's stretching to me big time. We are all so good, and I am really good. I have the gift of, of feeding people, of hosting people, of welcoming people that are in my circle. 
that are just like me? Would we treat someone with the least any differently if suddenly we discovered that was actually Jesus out there? It's our responsibility to do so. May it be so in my life and in yours. Amen. Friends, the giving of our money is one of the many ways that we can really partner with the ministries of this church as well as nonprofits in our area and around the world to be able to seek to meet the needs of those with the least. So I want to encourage you to support financially. If you are wondering what to do about or feeling led to give to any of the crises that are going around in our country, specifically with Afghanistan, please make sure to reach out to us. We have really reputable resources that we can point you to, especially the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. And so I want to encourage you to seek that out and to much whom has been given, much is required. morning. I would love to invite all of the kids who are with us this morning, all the children to come on up front. 
You guys can come and sit right here. And if you brought your backpacks this morning, which I think some of you did, we're excited that you did, you can bring your backpacks. And even if you're sitting up there in the balcony, you guys can come down the stairs. We'd love for you to come and join us this morning. Hi, good to see you guys. Come on up. We got backpacks. Y'all can sit right here, so find a good spot, Lachlan. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Got our backpacks on. We got kids making their way down to the front from the balcony. Hi, come on up. Perfect. What a good photo shot, too, if you guys want to take pictures. <laughs> come on up. You guys find a seat. Hi, good. Here we go. Make some room. You can sit on the bottom, too, if there's no space. But Perfect. We got, we got two backpacks. I might go down here, then, so I can actually see you guys. Well, we are excited that you're here. And I know we just finished kind of a big week for most of you. Raise your hand if you started school this past week. Did most of you guys start school? I think almost everybody, right? Okay, put your hands down. Um, yeah, you guys had meet the teacher for the first time. You probably went to your new classroom for the first time. Did anyone start a brand new school, like a brand new school that they'd never been to before? Brand new school? No one? <gasps> really? Wow. Does anyone have a, a friend in their class, like a really good friend in their class this year? Oh, good, right? Uh, parents, it was also a big week for you, right? Raise your hand, and kids can participate in this too. Who had their, like, first day of school picture taken? Parents, did you take those with the sign? I saw them all over social media, right? Kids, did you take a first day of school picture? Yeah, absolutely, right? So we wanted to celebrate the beginning of school, and we wanted to pray over you guys for the, for the school year that's starting. Um, and with that, I'm going to grab, we have a little gift that we're going to be giving you before you head back. And we have these fun little keychains, which I think are real cute. You guys can turn around and look at them. They're like little smiley guys. They also have a little fuzzy top. It's actually a screen cleaner. So I know a lot of us use devices in our schools. And so this is something that can kind of wipe your screen and clean it off. And I was thinking about that. Um, because this year, I know, kind of like last year, is still not quite back to normal, right? We still have things going on at school. COVID is still around. And so some of us are wearing masks and not wearing masks. Some of us might be a little bit nervous about that, about getting sick. And so we're still kind of thinking about how this is not a normal school year like we've experienced in the past. Um, but there are a couple of things I want us to remember. So when you guys get your keychain, I want you to put it on your backpack. And I want you to look at it every once in a while or maybe every time you use it. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about God's mercies being new every morning. Every morning we wake up and God's mercies are new. And I was thinking about that with this fun little screen cleaner. And I'm like, this kind of wipes your screen clean. And you kind of have this brand new start, this brand new beginning. And it's the same thing with you and the same thing with God. Every morning you wake up, God is with you. You have a fresh start. God loves you and he's going to be there with you. And so you have new mercies every single morning. And so I want you to hopefully think about that. Think about your church community, how much we love you and support you. And then think about that God just has so much love and he is with you every morning as you start this new school year. So I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to pass these out before you guys head back to your seat. Everyone's going to get a little keychain to take home, put on your backpack, and then um, hopefully you remember that throughout the year. So you guys pray with me. Jesus, we are excited for a brand new school year. Lots of new things, new teachers, new friends, new schools, new grades, Lord, can be really exciting. And I pray that we remember that as we start this new season, that you are going to be with us every single morning. That you love us so incredibly much, Lord. And that no matter what happens, no matter when times are hard, no matter when times are easy, no matter when we're laughing, no matter maybe even if we're crying, God, that you have your arms around us, you're holding our hand, and you are walking with us every step of the way, Lord. And we just love you for that. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. I have one here. I want to get that to you. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Emily. 
All right, you guys can take one of these back. Here you go. right now oh so you can see we have some extras so if our older kids middle school high schoolers if you want one too we'll put them out or if you have grandchildren and you want to take some for them as well please feel free to take a keychain yeah or adults too <laughs> I'm gonna take you up on that <laughs> y'all let's pray holy God the events of our days and weeks often remind us of the need of your presence, your mercy, your justice, provision, and help. Yet it is also the events of our days and weeks that distract from seeking that presence. So today, in this moment, we quiet our hearts to realize your presence and unite our hearts with yours. Today, we pray and celebrate the beginning of a new school year. We are so thankful for the education of our children. We also pray for teachers, counselors, principals, cafeteria workers, and all those that make these schools operate. We pray for the students as they grow and learn and as they experience setbacks and difficulties and situations. We pray for the surrounding community as we see evidence of division around the trials of a pandemic. Holy God, be with our schools and those within them. We also pray, O oh God, for our world. We bring to you our neighbors in Haiti as they deal with the aftermath of a hurricane. We bring to you our neighbors in Afghanistan as their country deals with the aftermath of a regime change and fear and despair abound for so many there. We ask that you raise up restorers and peacemakers and make ways for love of neighbor and light in the darkness. Lord, have mercy on these places. We also lift up to you those this day in our own lives who need your mercy. In this moment of silence, we speak the names of those in our lives that we know need your mercy, presence, and love. Holy God, we thank you for your presence in this moment. Help us to live in your presence more readily and more attentively so that we might love our neighbor, be curious about your activities in our world, forgive more readily, and take risks in the name of love and your kingdom. Lord, hear us now as we join our voice, voices in the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the, the power, power and the, the glory, glory forever. Amen.
The church of Christ cannot be bound by walls of wood or stone. Where charity and love are found, there can the church be known. True faith will open up the door and step in. Friends, if any of you are in need for a private prayer, I want to invite you over to the window to your left to pray with some members of our prayer team today. Friends, we have received a clear charge from Scripture from Jesus Christ himself. It is our responsibility as Christ followers to go and seek to meet the needs of the least of these. May you go from this place with new life taking the struggles of the past, the joys of the present, and the hopes of the future as stepping stones on this journey of faith. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, amen. amen.